Happy Cinco de Mayo! This is your AEW Dynamite review for Cinco de Mayo 2021. More appropriately, it is also, I am told, FMW Day. FMW Day, yes, the date of the famous No Ropes Exploding Barbed Wire death match between Terry Funk and Atsushi Onita. We saw Onita actually on Dynamite in the lead up to the No Ropes Barbed Wire match of Revolution. Remember they interviewed him for the video package before the Moxley Kenny Omega match? Very famous match in wrestling history on this day many years ago. Probably, uh, what, 27, 28 years ago now? Something like that. Very appropriate for the first blood and guts match in AEW history to be taking place on the very same date. This is your Dynamite Review Blood and Guts style. I am the Solomon Monster. Thank you for choosing me for your Dynamite Review coverage. They had about 50% capacity in the building tonight. And if you were watching the main event, right from the very beginning of that match, when the match was being introduced, everybody was making their entrances, the bell rings, the match begins. If you would have told me that it was a full capacity crowd in the building tonight, you could have fooled me. These people were fucking amped up for everything these guys were doing. Those people were loud as loud could be for that main event. It was music to my ears. I don't care what you thought about that main event. If you loved it, if you hated it, if you're kind of in the middle on it, if you were disappointed in the ending, which I know some of you were, so was I. I'll tell you why in a second. But wherever you fall on the spectrum, you got to say one thing. It is a beautiful thing to hear a loud, passionate crowd of people and not 500 people, 1,000 people. But to hear a packed audience like that going nuts. For anything. Music to my ears. That was one of that was probably the, my favorite thing of the evening. Was hearing that crowd reaction. It was it was infectious. I don't see how it couldn't get you amped up for what you were seeing. A very bloody affair, which I think is really what separates this match that we saw tonight in the main event from the war games matches that we have had in NXT. You know, and the War Games matches in NXT, even the women's, I mean, for the most part, I've enjoyed them. There have been some really good War Games matches in NXT. It's a different style of match. No roof on the cage, they could do moves off the top. But what I mean is, what was the big separating factor in what you saw tonight as compared to the NXT matches? What, what was the number one thing? Blood. It was in the name of the match. You can't have a blood and guts match without fucking blood. We had a lot of blood tonight. Now you could say maybe too much blood. But if you're going to do a War Games match, if you're going to do a cage match, if you're going to do a Hell in a Cell match, I'm not saying guys should start cutting themselves open left and right, but look, if you're going to do the stipulation, you've got to live up to the stipulation, and you have to have blood. Matches like this don't work without blood. And tonight was a great example of that. This match had something that those matches in NXT don't have because they have a policy of not doing that and it does take away from the match a little bit if you're going to be hitting each other with weapons and you're going to be you know like a cheese grater raking their face against the cage and all kinds of stuff then there's got to be blood and you had plenty of that but you knew that going in because it was in the name of the match so if you were looking for violence if you were looking for a match that was uh, more brutal than the average cage match that you would be used to seeing. I think this match delivered in that respect. Uh, this felt to me more so than the NXT ones, a lot closer to what you would find in some of those original matches in the 80s. And it's not surprising, you had one of the people who knows a thing or two about that was at ringside, Tully Blanchard. I wouldn't be surprised to find out he had some input into what we saw in this match tonight. Tully works for the company. Arn works for the company. These guys know what these kinds of matches are all about. They know how to deliver a War Games match the right way because these are the fucking guys that innovated it in the first place. What hurt the match? There were a couple of things. And I know this is an unavoidable issue. So... I don't want to put all the blame on the company for it because it's not as if it's the company's fault. It's a necessary evil. 
But this is the challenge when you do a match like this on television. You have to contend with the commercial breaks. There were, by my count, what were there, four? I, I want to say four. Somewhere in that range. Commercial breaks. Now, most of them were picture-in-picture, picture, but again, I fucking hate picture-in-picture. Picture. You may as well just go to full commercial for all I care. You know, I'm not trying to pay attention and follow what's going on in a little tiny box. That hurt the flow of the match. It's unavoidable, but it did. And that's why you usually see a match like this is reserved for a pay-per-view or an NXT takeover, which is basically a pay-per-view. You do matches like this on pay-per-view so that you can avoid having to take commercial breaks, which kills the flow of the match, let alone when you have four of them. So even though I don't blame AEW for that, it did hurt the match because of the constant ad breaks back and forth. It just takes you out of it. And then they come back, and before you know it, they're right back to break again. But we got to talk about that finish. And I'm going to go into all the details later on. I don't want to blow it all right now. But as far as the ending of the match, because there's going to be a lot of talk about this. I think this is going to be a very polarizing finish to this match. I said coming into this show tonight that the Pinnacle had to walk away with the victory. The Pinnacle is the newer faction that needs to be established. The Inner Circle have already been around for over a year. They've been around since day one. Well over a year, year and a half. They were heels, now they're baby faces. The Inner Circle is already an established faction. The Pinnacle is brand new. And you're going to build to this big match and have the Pinnacle lose? I don't think so. So the Pinnacle winning was the only outcome in this match that made sense. And that's what we got tonight. The heels won, as they should have. The way in which they won, even though you had a top on the cage, the action did spill outside. We ended up with Jericho and MJF on top. And it built to this big spot at the very end where MJF shoved Chris Jericho off the top of the cage and he took a big fall about 10 feet or so, 10 or 12 feet off the top of the cage, down through a gimmicked portion of the stage. Gimmicked to the point where it was made to look like those metal grates, but it was clearly cardboard. Now, I'm not saying that Chris Jericho should take a bump off the top of the cage through an actual metal grade, although I'm sure that's something Darby Allen would do in a heartbeat. I'm going to talk about his fucking dumbass a little bit later on in the show. For the love of God, if you know that you are setting up a spot like that and you've got cardboard, why do you shoot it head on? Why is the camera right there on top of the action shooting what is so obviously going to look like a fake phony, ridiculous-looking, weak spot. I'm not going to put this in the category of the big botch at the end of Revolution. This was not a botch. This was bad judgment. There is a way that you can shoot this without making it look so underwhelming. They didn't do that. So I'm watching this thinking, man, he's going to take this big bump off the top of the cage, this big devastating thing. Maybe now it's going to be a big injury angle for Jericho. And he falls on top, on, on top of some boxes. <laughs> and it just takes you out of the moment. That is AEW. So I don't blame AEW for the commercials, but I do blame AEW for their judgment in shooting that final scene, that final spot, the way that they did. The match was already over at that point. The inner circle had surrendered to try to save Jericho. MJF being the dick that he is, shoved him off anyway. That was the idea behind the finish, and I loved it because MJF is an asshole. He's exactly the kind of person who would do something like that. But you've got to do a better job. Use your head when you're going to shoot a spot like that. It looks so ridiculous. And it just it took me out of the moment. That would be my biggest complaint about that main event. The action from bell to bell and everything going on inside the two rings, I loved. It was pure chaos. I wasn't watching it for some kind of technical masterpiece. I was watching it to see guys bleed and beat the fuck out of each other. And that's what we got. But you can't, you know, I don't think you can judge this match without factoring in the way in which that finish was shot. So we're going to talk about the entire match. We're going to talk about the entire show. Who won, who lost. They've set up a lot of matches going forward, not only for next week, but for Double or Nothing coming up on May 30th. 
we now have a much clearer picture of the pay-per-view and who's going to be challenging for what championship. But before we get into all of that, let me again thank all of you for tuning in tonight to your uh, Dynamite stream as we do each and every Wednesday night here on the channel. And uh, if you would be so kind, please do hit that like button, hit that thumbs up. And if you are not a subscriber, hit that subscribe button. That way, when more content goes up, you will be notified and uh, you can join us live each and every week for all the good fun that we're having. You'll see Super Chats popping up on your screen here. There's Crying Big Show. Ah, he was crying over the way they shot that finish. Super Chats are open. I'm sure you guys are going to have a lot to say about this War Games match. Go ahead and send in those Super Chats. I'm going to read each and every comment and question that you send in to me before the night is over. And when you do so, you support the channel at the same time. If you join and become a channel member, that's awesome. That's another way to support the channel. Just hit that join button down below. So I thank you. And before we get into everything that happened here on the show tonight, there was some news earlier on today. Tony Khan, who I guess has his weekly segment on Busted Open Radio every Wednesday before Dynamite, he was on Busted Open. And he announced that Double or Nothing on May 30th, the big pay-per-view coming up, is going to be taking place in front of a full capacity crowd outdoors at Daly's Place. This will be the first full capacity AEW crowd in Daly's Place since pre-pandemic. And really the first full capacity AEW crowd of any kind since the beginning of the pandemic, since whatever that show was in mid-March of last year before everything just went straight to hell. That's probably around 5,500 people. Uh, they are outdoors, so uh, you know I guess that's a good thing. Uh, but again, this will be the biggest AEW crowd in over a year, coming up on May 30th. And they're doing other events as well in conjunction with Double or Nothing. They're having some kind of a live event that Friday. They're going to be doing a fan fest on Saturday. So they're really going to make the whole weekend, uh, Memorial Day weekend, a big event. So that, that's the update from Tony Khan as of earlier today. Shout out to Steve Mello for his... Uh, Wonderful work that he does here on the layouts every week. I told him, I said, I want some blood. We're doing blood and guts. I want some, pretend it's Halloween. I want some blood. So he gave us blood and guts. So everybody, uh, give, give a cheers uh, beer emoji in the chat for Steve Mello. Thank you to him for all of his help. Dynamite Open with Kenny Omega, the AEW champion, among other, many other titles he holds. And Michael Nakazawa against John Moxley and Eddie Kingston. All of the matches, uh, with the exception of that Blood and Guts main event tonight, were pre-taped. These matches that you saw in the first hour of Dynamite tonight did not take place tonight live. The second hour was live. Uh, the first hour was not. These matches were taped last week. And I saw some reports from people who were in the building tonight who said that the crowd noise that you heard, the live crowd tonight, they were watching everything on a screen. They were the ones providing the crowd noise for all of the matches that you saw tonight. So even though they weren't happening physically in the building, the voices and the, and the chants and everything that we heard were from the live crowd in Jacksonville tonight, which is a little odd. But apparently that's how they decided to work things. They did have two rings side by side for all of these matches tonight, although uh, each match was only in one ring until the main event. So Don Callis came out at the beginning with Michael Nakazawa, no Kenny Omega. And he said that Kenny Omega was not there tonight, so Michael Nakazawa would go into this match and he would go it alone, which was news to Nakazawa. Moxley and Eddie Kingston, they come out of the crowd to make their entrance. They get jumped from behind by Kenny Omega, who uh, attacks with his uh, AEW title belt. Omega and Nakazawa, they're beating down Eddie Kingston in the ring until Moxley runs in to even the odds. Moxley and Kingston, they brought the fight out to the floor. They sent the uh, opposition into the barricades. Back in the ring, they double-team Nakazawa. So the referee was distracted at one point. Nakazawa hit a low blow on Kingston. Omega isolated Kingston in the corner, hit a Kotaro crusher for a near fall. Kingston avoided a moonsault, hit a running clothesline, got the hot tag to John Moxley. 
and in comes the IWGP. United States champion preparing for his big title defense next week. Shout out to Lou Rivera, who just joined the channel and became a sound off superstar. Lou, I salute you. Thank you, good sir. Welcome to the family. So Moxley comes in, he's teeing off on Nakazawa. Nakazawa fires up and he rips off his shirt, or he takes his shirt off, but he was uh, folded up like an accordion, German suplex, pile driver. Omega breaks up the fall. Moxley applies the rear naked choke as Eddie Kingston is uh, running interference. Kingston then offers Kenny Omega the chance to come on in. You want to save your boy? Now's your chance. And Omega says, you know what? He thinks better of it. He walks away. Kingston and Omega, they hit a clothesline into a half-and-half half suplex for the win. Out come the Young Bucks. I don't know what Matt Jackson was doing. He was wearing a bathing suit. Somehow he ended up with all of his clothes off, except the bathing suit. Nick Jackson looked dressed like a normal person. Well, semi-normal person. He's got the earring and everything. So the Young Bucks come out. They're on stage. They're providing the distraction. The Good Brothers attack Moxley and Kingston from behind. They hit the magic killer. Young Bucks are in the ring now with super kicks. Kenny Omega drops Eddie Kingston with the one-winged angel. So it looks to be John Moxley and Eddie Kingston very likely going to challenge the Young Bucks for the AEW Tag Team titles at Double or Nothing at the end of the month. We already know one match that's official. They made this clear at the very beginning of the show, and it's the match that I've been talking about since Revolution, really. I said it all leads to Double or Nothing. What did I say? Britt Baker. This is when Britt Baker was ranked like number three or number four in the rankings. Red Velvet was ahead of her <laughs> in the rankings. And I think Ty Conti was number one. And I told you all, the moment she lost in the Lights Out match to Thunder Rosa, which was a non-sanctioned match. So remember, in a non-sanctioned Lights Out match, it does not count towards your win-loss record. And I said, the moment that she lost that match and had that impressive performance, I said, from this point forward, Britt Baker needs to do nothing but win. That's all she needs to do. All I do is win. That should be her theme song. And Ty Conti will challenge for the championship on television at some point, and she'll lose. And Red Velvet will probably wrestle Jade Cargill, and she'll lose. And what happened? What happened? Red Velvet wrestled Jade Cargill, and she lost. Ty Conti wrestled Hikaru Shida, and she lost. And look where we are. Britt Baker. The number one contender for the women's championship. She will go one-on-one -on -one with Sheeta at double or nothing. Everything is set up perfectly for a Britt Baker win. The long reign of Sheeta is about to come to an end. To the best heel in the women's division. It's all set up perfectly. Cody Rhodes. He went one-on-one -on -one with QT Marshall. Cody attacked him before the bell. Hit a suplex right away. He was about to whip QT with his weight belt. Bryce Remsburg stepped in. He says, no, no. He took the belt away. Shout out to Rodimus Prime. Look at Rodimus Prime here on Blood and Guts Night with the $40 Super Chat drop. Rodimus, what is going on, my friend? What did Rodimus think of Blood and Guts? We'll find out when we get to all your Super Chats. So Bryce Remsburg takes the weight belt away from Cody. And as he is uh, taking the belt away, QT Marshall hits Cody with his own belt, which the referee saw and for whatever reason was not a uh, disqualification. So QT at one point got up in Arn Anderson's face on the outside of the ring. And he was kind of pushing him around and... <laughs> Boo! It is the Mantar $75 super chat from Jared. You know, that scares the shit out of me every single time it goes off because I, I start hearing it and I'm thinking there's like a cat dying outside my window and I want to stop the stream so I could go help this wounded animal outside my window. And then I look at my screen and I see my freaking face going, Boo! and I realize. It's not a cat. It's half man, half tar. Thank you, Jared. 
Thank you for scaring the crap out of me. Fucking dying animal outside my window. I'm gonna go put the thing out of its misery. Holy shit. So Arn Anderson, he don't take none of this. You're not gonna put your hands on double A. He rears back. He nails QT with a shot. And the referees have to come and they have to separate them. And Arn Anderson is ejected from ringside. So off goes Arn. He's, uh, he's taken away. So we move ahead. Cody and QT firing away on each other with right hands. Cody goes for a sunset flip and he partially pulled down QT's trunks. Thankfully, this match was taped and this was not live. So we had a little video distortion. You know, crack kills. We don't need to be seeing that. Not from, uh, not, not from Uncle QT here. Cody goes to the top rope, he hits a moonsault for a near fall, goes for a disaster kick into Cody Cutter, but he falls right into a crossroads, he get, eats his own move, and he kicks out. He, he no-sold his own finish. Cody kicks out, Marshall picks Cody up for a buckle bomb, sets him up for a tombstone pile driver, and they do, and I love this spot. Undertaker did this a few times, in fact, Undertaker did this in a match once with Steve Austin. At the cold day in hell. No, I'm, it was a cold day in hell? Yes, it was. It was the cold day in hell. In your house pay-per-view. The things I remember and the things I don't are just weird. May of 1997. One of the better matches that Austin and Undertaker, I thought, had with each other. I love that spot. Undertaker picks him up for a tombstone, falls backwards. Now Austin's got him in position for a tombstone. He falls backwards. They did that spot here. Ultimately, Cody dropped him for a tombstone. QT kicked out. Somewhere in here, Cody got busted open. We got a lot of blood on this show. <laughs> Not just in the main event, but here as well. Cody got, uh, he got cut under the eye. I didn't see how it happened. We had QT walking right into a crossroads for a very close near fall. And QT is out of it and, you know, he and Cody, they exchange this long uh, gaze. And Cody takes him down, locks on the figure four leg lock. QT Marshall has nowhere to go. He's got no place to go. And he taps out, as he should have. Cody wins. I thought the match was good. Match was good. Match was fine. Probably the best QT match I've seen. But it just felt beneath Cody. This whole thing, this whole feud. Yeah, I understand that QT is well-respected. I'm sure QT is very well-respected. I'm sure he's a great trainer. And he's, a, he's perfectly fine as a worker. But this has, from day one, felt completely beneath Cody. That's what this was. This, this is like uh, Chris Jericho wrestling Fandango at WrestleMania 29. It just doesn't fit. You know? This is like Shawn Michaels working with Chris Masters after he just worked Hulk Hogan at SummerSlam. Now he's going to go work the masterpiece. This whole thing felt beneath Cody, where Cody's position on the show. Should, although I don't know what they're doing with Cody anymore at this point. Cody's had a weird fucking year. When you look back at what they've done with Cody, Cody, it's just bizarre. Maybe he's just preoccupied. His wife is pregnant. He's filming a reality show. He was doing the, the TBS show. It seems like he's just been preoccupied by other things where... His programs on this show just don't seem to be much of a priority. So here he got to work with a good friend, give QT a little bit of the rub. I don't think it did much for QT. But in any event, especially him kicking out of the crossroads, like you're going to waste that on, a, on, on QT Marshall? I, I don't know. Anthony Agogo, he came out with a gut punch. One punch, drops Cody to the mat. And he covers Cody. He drapes the Union Jack over his body. So that would appear to be Cody's double or nothing opponent. We're going to find out next Wednesday what Cody's big announcement is regarding double or nothing. I'm sure it's a match against uh, a go go. And that's going to be interesting because what they've established is that all a go go has to do is punch you in the stomach. And apparently you're done for. There's no recovering from this. So now that he's going to have to work a competitive match against someone, how are they going to explain this? Are they going to ban him from punching people below a certain part of their anatomy? Is Cody going to run away and avoid a single punch for the entire match? 
Now we get to see how they're going to logically explain this. Because if you're Anthony Agogo, the first thing you do when you get in the ring is you punch the guy in the stomach. And they've already established that the match is over at that point. And if Cody isn't finished and he fights back, you punch him a second time. How are they going to get an actual match out of this guy? I'm assuming this is going to be the match at Double or Nothing. We got a recap of the recent uh, storyline with Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky attacking Darby Allen and Sting, the big brawl from the end of last week's show, which included Scorpio Sky locking, if you recall, a heel hook on Sting. Maybe that's why we didn't see Sting. Hey, no Sting. Unless I missed something, if I uh, stepped away for a second, I believe this might be the first episode, maybe since he debuted, that we have not seen Sting. Was there a promo I missed? Somebody in the chat tell me. Every time I say this, someone's like, oh, there was a promo you missed. I don't recall there being a promo. I don't. He certainly wasn't out there with Darby. I believe that the uh, the streak may be over. I think we may have actually had our first our first show where Sting did not make a single appearance, which is shocking and ridiculous all at the same time because Sting should not be on television every week anyway. So they recapped that. We had Scorpio Sky and uh, Ethan Page. Okay, I got confirmation in the chat. In fact, no Sting. No, no, Dan, I'm not counting the recap. Don't be a wise ass. No Sting. Okay, so now we've established that. Alex Marvez was up in the balcony with Sky and Page, and Scorpio Sky referred to Sting as Steve at one point. I was kind of hoping he would call him uh, Real Estate Steve. That's an old reference to his TNA days. And he said, Showtime's over. I'm the franchise now, bitch. That's what Scorpio Sky said. Ethan Page was talking about Darby. He referred to a past history they had together. He said... The reason you wear that face paint is because you're covering up the dent that I once put in your forehead. Then he mentioned the metal plate, I think, in his arm. All of a sudden, Darby Allen shows up alone. He, like a bat out of hell. He came out of nowhere. He attacks both guys all by himself. Remember, no sting. You know, Papa is not around this week. There's no sting. There's no baseball bat. No dark order on the show tonight. Nobody to save him. He attacks both guys. He climbs a ladder. I don't mean a ladder that they use in the matches. I mean like at a at a stadium. If you were outside your apartment building, right, you might see one of those ladders, right, that climbs up onto the fire escape or something. So there's a ladder there, and he starts climbing it a little bit, and then he jumps off and hits a coffin drop, like a small coffin drop on Scorpio Sky. I'm sorry, on Ethan Page. Scorpio Sky, though, comes, <laughs> he comes running. You see him in the background, right? And he comes running into the camera frame with a garbage, like one of these plastic or rubber garbage cans, whacks Darby right in the head with it. I don't care what that thing is made of. You hit somebody in the head with that as hard as Scorpio Sky hit him in the head with this thing, and you'll you'll scramble the guy's brains. Then again, I'm not sure Darby has brains in the first place, considering the bump that he took here. They take him by the uh, flight of stairs. Okay, there's a flight of concrete stairs. They're outside on the balcony at Daly's place. There's a short staircase. And I could already tell, like, this is giving me flashbacks to Brock Lesnar and Zach Gowan. And, you know, I could see where this is going, right? Or at least Zach Gowan. I think he was in a wheelchair when he got thrown down the flight of stairs. And it probably was a stunt man anyway in that, in that one. That was a taped SmackDown. Uh, I guess this was taped too. But anyway. They knock Darby down the staircase. They throw him down the staircase. And the first few steps, I mean, he hits hard. Okay? And rolls down the staircase to the midway point. Not all the way to the bottom. But this was just ridiculously dangerous. This ridiculously dangerous, stupid bump. I mean, it really is dumb. This guy is one of your top stars, right? He's actually proven to be the closest thing to a ratings mover, a consistent ratings draw on this show for them. He is their champion. He is their their second biggest champion in the company. And you have him, you know, whether who his idea, whoever's idea it is, taking bumps like this. And you're so close to the pay-per-view. 
He's got a match next week. I wouldn't leave anything to chance. He's one of the last people that you can ill afford to lose right now. Omega would be number one because he's the champ. And remember, Omega a few months ago had a torn, uh, I think, rotator cuff or a torn labrum in his shoulder. Didn't have surgery. He's just been working through it. You can ill afford to lose someone like Darby Allen right now. This was such a ridiculously just stupid bump. It looked brutal. So, I mean, it served its purpose. But you got to ask yourself, is the risk worth the reward? I say no. This man is out of his mind. And whoever okayed that is also out of their mind. Britt Baker, you are number one contender. One-on-one -on -one against Julia Hart, making her dynamite debut. Don't know much about Julia Hart. Actually, don't know anything about Julia Hart. This is my first time seeing her as well. Uh, very short. This went maybe a minute. Britt hit the uh, air raid crash, and she pulled Julia's head off the mat like a good heel. Didn't want to win with that. She wanted to win with her move. So she got the glove from Rebel. Not Reba. They're putting that in the artwork now for the pay-per-view. I don't know if you noticed that. When they showed the graphic for Sheeta against Britt Baker, it showed Rebel. And it said Rebel, and then in parentheses, not Reba. So that's part of her gimmick now. Handed her the glove. And Britt put the glove on, put Lockjaw on, and that was it. Julia tapped out. We had a Technique by Taz segment. This is a segment where... He voices over this minute-long video package on an opponent for one of his men and evaluates their weaknesses. I like this. Simple, sports-like. One of the few sports-like elements that they actually did incorporate into the show when they do stuff like this. I know that's one of the major complaints I hear from people who don't like AEW. I thought it was going to be more sports-oriented, and now i got to watch Orange Cassidy, and i got to watch Marco Stunt. Where is the sports-oriented stuff? Well, here it, here it is. It's segments like this. Technique with Taz. He's talking about Christian Cage and the flaws in his frog splash and the flaws in his kill switch. Probably going to be Christian and, I mean, I would guess Christian and Ricky Starks would be the match. That's the match I'm hoping for. Cage against uh, Starks. Christian, that is, not Brian. We're, we're not there yet. We're not yet at the point of the breakup of Team Taz, although it feels like it's coming. So this was shortened to the point, and I liked it. Then we had a four-way match to determine who would challenge the Young Bucks next week on Dynamite for the AEW Tag Team titles. But before, before I do that, I want to remind all of you, because I know some of you took advantage of this last week. Real quick reminder here. You got until May 24th. You only got a few more weeks left. I want you guys, forget what that says. It is no longer a 30-day free trial. It is three free months of Amazon Music, all you have to do is use our link. Get amazonmusic.com slash Solomonster. That is the new offer, but it's only good until May 24th. So if you want to sample the service free for three months, that's 90 days. You know what happens in 90 days when somebody gets shit canned from WWE, unless their name is Andrade? You got to wait 90 days before you can go work somewhere else. You know, if one of those released WWE people were listening to this stream right now, they would see that and go, oh, I know how I'm going to spend my 90 days. I'm going to sign up with Solomonster's code because they're smart. So take advantage. Be like them. Get AmazonMusic.com slash Solomonster. And yes, that is true. That offer is open to any of the released WWE talents who need something to listen to until they can go find work somewhere else. Consider it a gift from me. We had SCU, Jurassic Express, Varsity Blondes, and the Acclaimed. Four-way match, not elimination style, but it is a four-way match to determine the number one contenders for the tag titles. Kazarian and Jungle Boy, they started things off. Traded pinfall attempts. 
the acclaimed, they were uh, in control for a while. They cut off Chris Daniels in their corner. Luchasaurus tagged in and he was taking everybody out. He took out both members of the acclaimed. He hit choke slams on Brian Pillman Jr., who we're going to see on television tomorrow night. Big premiere, season three, Dark Side of the Ring. First episode, two parter, Brian Pillman. I know they talked to his son, so we'll get to see him on Vice uh, tomorrow night. So he took a choke slam. Garrison got choke slammed onto Pillman. Kazarian entered the ring. He got choke slammed onto Pillman and Garrison, who at this point now were on the outside. This was a very sloppy looking choke slam. This did not look good. Kazarian is lucky he didn't crash and burn on the ground, but they caught him barely. Jungle Boy tagged in. He hit stereo uh, Death Valley drivers on the acclaimed with uh, Luchasaurus. So they covered Anthony Bowens. Daniels broke up the pin. Pillman and Jungle Boy were the legal men. Jungle Boy climbed up to the top rope, and Chris Daniels crotched him on the ropes. Luchasaurus dragged Daniels to the floor. Kazarian entered, knocked down Jungle Boy. This led to SCU hitting a pile driver on Pillman with Daniels coming off the top at the same time for the best moonsault ever. And they get the win. SCU will challenge the Bucks next Wednesday for the tag team titles. I thought this was good. I wouldn't go, you know, I wouldn't go gaga over it. It was good. Nothing more. It served its purpose. The problem with this match is the outcome here was never in doubt. You knew exactly who was going to win. Because the next time that Daniels and Kazarian lose, they're done as a team. So of course they were going to win this match. And now they're going to go to Dynamite next week. And that is the beginning of the end of SCU. It's not just the beginning of the end. It's the end of the end. When they lose, that's it. The big payoff is next week. I actually don't think they pushed that angle as hard as they should have. Now, the announcers may have mentioned it once, but this is something that you, you know, it's on them to really make this out to be a big deal. Even though you know SCU is not, you know, they're not one of the big, big teams anymore in AEW. They were at the beginning, and they've been overshadowed by other teams. They've really been on the back burner for a while. From the moment they announced this, I said this last week, when Kazarian confronted Daniels on that Britt Baker talk show, that was on, I think, an episode of Dark, when he made the announcement that the next time you and I lose a match, that's it, SCU is done. They didn't even air that on, I mean, maybe a replay, they put that on Dynamite, but that segment didn't air on Dynamite. That was in December. It's been months and barely a mention on television of the fact that these guys have been undefeated for the last four months and the next match they lose, they're done as a team. Even tonight, I don't feel they pushed it as hard as they should have. So that just goes to show you that, you know, SCU is just not a priority right now. They may as well break them up. Kazarian would be better off taking a chance and venturing out on his own. Daniels, I don't know what his plans are, if he's going to stay singles or if he's going to kind of fade off into the sunset and do more things behind the scenes. I don't know what his plans are. They really didn't push this story as hard as they should have going into the match next week. This was one of the best parts of the show. Video package that came next to promote the... IWGP United States Championship match next week on Dynamite. John Moxley defending the title against Yuji Nagata. As I said, I am not exactly a Yuji Nagata mark. I'm aware of Yuji Nagata, who he is, his history. I used to see him on WCW Monday Nitro. I know he's a former IWGP heavyweight champion. The man is 53 years old. He can still go. He's one of the elder statesmen there in New Japan Pro Wrestling. He's not a new guy. It's not about Yuji Nagata. Whatever match they have next week, I'm sure it'll be good. It'll be fun. It's the fact that this is hopefully the first in a long line of interpromotional things that New Japan and AEW will do together in the months to come. So I'm excited about that. But this video package was great. They were talking about next week's match. They got footage from New Japan, so they were showing us footage of Moxley, all the people he's beaten since becoming the champion. They had footage in there of of Nagata in action. Moxley was offended by being called a punk. He said Nagata would learn that his mouth could get him in trouble. He claimed that he invited Nagata here to the States 
for this match with respect. That respect was not reciprocated, and so therefore he would teach him a lesson in the ring next week on Dynamite. I thought this was well done, and I am looking forward to that match on the show next Wednesday. We had Kenny Omega coming on out to be interviewed next to the big cage. They were getting ready for the main event. And out comes Kenny Omega for an interview with Tony Schiavone. We were going to find out who his challenger will be for the championship at Double or Nothing on May 30th. Because it really wasn't clear. Especially now that it looks like Moxley and Kingston are probably going to challenge for the tag team titles. Like, well, who does Omega defend against, right? It's, it's way too soon for Hangman Page. Hangman Page just lost to Brian Cage. Hangman Page ain't challenging for no titles anytime soon. They're going to have to just heat him back up. He's not ice cold, but he's cold. They're going to have to heat him back up. Getting people back into the buildings, by the way, is going to do a lot to help him. Because he was coming across, he and Darby were really starting to come across as major stars right before the pandemic shut everything down. So those fan reactions when he walks out are a big part of what makes him seem like a big deal. So they're better off waiting. They're better off waiting until All Out. They're better off waiting until Full Gear in November. Full Gear, isn't that like a, a play, you know, a, a being the elite play off something involving Hangman Page, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of like his thing. It's his show. But that's later in the year. You can't do the match now. It would be completely fucking foolish. So the question is, who does Omega defend the championship against? Well, Tony Schiavone... Well, let me just say this. Omega was out with all of his belts. So he had the AEW title around his waist. He had Nakazawa with him. And he was helping to carry the AAA Mega title, which Andrade just challenged Omega to a match at Triple Mania later this year for the AAA Mega title. Kenny Omega said, oh, I'm a busy guy. I'll get back to you. I'll let you know. Of course, the match is going to happen. Depending on the timing of the match and when Triple Mania is, I think there's a very good chance that you know, Andrade will walk away with the championship. I would have Omega lose his AEW title first. I would not have Omega lose anything until he loses in his company. Which you could do. If he drops the AEW title in November, Triple Mania is in December. I know it's not usually in December, but the way things are, who knows when it'll be. But I would not have Omega lose uh, anything. Uh, before he loses that AEW title. But Nakazawa also had the Impact title that he just won from Rich Swan, and the TNA title. And for those of you wondering, wait a minute. Hold up. I thought Impact and TNA were one and the same. Why is there an Impact title and a TNA title? Don't ask. No, I'm sure an Impact fan in the chat will let you know. Don't ask. Next week, it's going to be Pac one-on-one -on -one with Orange Cassidy in a world title eliminator match. The winner will challenge Kenny Omega for the championship at Double or Nothing on May 30th. So Pac against Omega or Orange Cassidy against Kenny Omega. That is going to be the, I say main event. I assume that's going to be the last match on the card unless they do some kind of big gimmick match like they did with Stadium Stampede. Remember Stadium Stampede was the main event last year? Not Moxley against uh, Brody Lee. Or was it? Now that I think back to it, no, I'm pretty sure uh, Stadium Stampede went on last. I'm almost positive it did. So Omega is running down his history with Pac. They have a lot of history together. Pac has some wins over him as well. And he was ready for the match with Pac. He goes, let's do it right now. Let's go. Let's get the match signed for double or nothing. Me one-on-one -on -one against Pac. And Tony Schiavone said, no, 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 we can't do that. Next week, world title eliminator. Out comes Orange Cassidy. To loud chance of freshly squeezed. He's another one of those guys, like Darby and like Hangman, who, as they get more people into these buildings in the months to come, we're going to really find out how over this guy either still is, or we're going to find out that he's not as over as AEW wants everybody to believe. From the sounds of it tonight, 
Now, this is their building. I don't know how it'll be when they go back out on the road. But from the sounds of that crowd tonight, Orange Cassidy is still one of the more over guys in the entire company. They were chanting for this guy like they thought he should be the one challenging for Kenny Omega's title at the pay-per-view. I have a different uh, take on things. But Kenny Omega pulled the Ray-Bans off of Orange Cassidy. He placed them on Michael Nakazawa. The entire time Orange Cassidy stood there, he did nothing. He never took his glasses back. He didn't smack the guy in the face. He didn't say a word. He just stood there. And he allowed Kenny Omega to browbeat him and berate him and insult him on the microphone. And then Kenny Omega said, I'm out of here. And he left. And Nakazawa left with the man's shades. And he did nothing. He just stood there. I thought that this segment was uh, pretty lame. I, I wasn't a fan of this segment. I thought it was no good. I am hoping for a pack win. I don't care what those fucking people in Jacksonville were chanting for. I want to see a pack win next week, even though I'm almost positive we're not going to get one. This segment was done by design. This is the match that they're setting up for. It is probably going to be Orange Cassidy challenging Kenny Omega. It's, the ma it's a match we've not seen before. It is a fresh match. I will give you that. But uh, I cannot vote against an Omega in a pack match. Every time those two guys are in the ring together, it is excellent. Pack deserves at least one championship main event match. He is that good. He hasn't really been focused on too much lately, which is too bad. I'm hoping for a, uh, a pack Omega match. So after the break, Miro is out. And Miro is out with a contract in his hand. And he says that he's going to be getting a TNT title match with Darby Allen next week. Tony Schiavone said, well, pending his medical condition, if he's cleared, if he's able to compete, otherwise he may have to forfeit the title. And Miro said, no, I don't want any forfeits. I don't want to be handed the championship. Nothing like that. He says, if Darby, even if Darby can go, I want him anyway. He said, the man who doesn't mind dying against the man who doesn't mind killing him. You see, that's the Miro I've been waiting for. The killer. That's a good line. That's the Miro that I've been waiting to see. And things are set up now for a title change next week. People have been asking me, do you think it's Lance Archer who's going to get a title shot? I said, no, I think it's Miro. I think that was even one of the predictions I did on the prediction show at the beginning of the year. Who's going to take the title from Darby Allen? You got Archer, you've got Jungle Boy, you've got all these different possibilities. I said, I think it's going to be Miro. That's the perfect place for him to be. Miro's not going to hold the AEW title anytime soon. The TNT title. He could take that title off of Darby. I think he and Darby could actually have a hell of a match. But they now have given Darby a storyline injury excuse for when he loses next week. He was injured, thanks to Ethan Page. Miro is going to kill this dude next week. Either he's going to forfeit or they're going to have a match and Miro is going to win. So we're going to have a new TV champion next week. TNT, same thing. And uh, his name is Miro. We had a, another new member sign up, and I believe it was Jared M. Same Jared who dropped 75 bucks a little bit earlier. Jared is a new member of the channel. Thank you, Jared. I appreciate that. Jacob Donnelly. I see you. We're about to get into the main event. Jacob is dropping 30 bucks here on the stream. This is the first Dynamite stream here for the month of May. So I am uh, so happy that all of you are joining me here. We're getting, the, uh, we're getting the month started on a high note here on Cinco de Mayo. Oh, that's the Christian Cage one. He's still looking. Then it was time for Blood and Guts. The Blood and Guts main event, two rings topped off by one cage, one roof. The inner circle, Chris Jericho, Sammy Guevara, Jake Hager, Santana and Ortiz, who had the dead president's face paint on, against the pinnacle, MJF, Wardlow, Sean Spears, 
Dax Harwood and Cash Wheeler with Tully Blanchard outside the ring. Tully Blanchard has uh, been a part of his fair share of War Games matches, as Tony Schiavone and Jim Ross were pointing out on commentary, including the original back in 87. Right, He was right in the middle of all that stuff. Tully Blanchard has been a part of some pretty classic cage matches before, going back to the Magnum TA one, right? Almost spiked his eye, United States Championship match back in 85. What was that, Starcade, I think? Once all the competitors have entered, as per the rules, it would be submission or surrender only. No pinfalls in this match, which is another difference uh, between this and the NXT version of those matches. I believe pinfalls are allowed in the NXT version. So this was like a traditional war game setup. Uh, not just the, the roof on the cage, but, you know, in the uh, Hell in a Cell matches. We didn't know if this might be a case where the cage would be surrounding the ring, but it would leave a gap outside where you can fight on the floor. There was no gap. You were either in ring number one or ring number two. The cage was right up against the ropes. I mean, there was a little bit of space between the ropes and the cage, but uh, it was not Hell in a Cell style. This was very much like traditional War Games style. We started out with Sammy Guevara in one ring, Dax Harwood in the other. For the opening five-minute period, Sammy vaulted himself over the top rope from one ring onto Harwood in the other. This is the first time that Sammy, I believe, has been in action on Dynamite in what feels like months. When was the last time we saw Sammy Guevara in a match on this show? As far as I know, he's not been hurt. It's just kind of weird how he hasn't wrestled in, uh, in quite some time. But he looked good tonight. Harwood hit an Arn Anderson-esque spine buster. I think Arn would be proud of that uh, spine buster that he hit here. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing all the colors out of the corner of my eye here. All these, uh, I see green and yellow, and I saw a pink super chat earlier. I love it. I can't wait to read through all of your messages. Before I came on the air in the chat, I saw a lot of divided opinion about this match. This is going to be a very polarizing match. My guess is most people will have a positive view of the match, more than negative. But clearly, there is a lot of divided opinion about this main event tonight. Harwood got cut open by the uh, chain link fence very early. He was a bloody mess less than five minutes into the match. I mean, he already had the crimson mask on. <laughs> Way too early to be bleeding in this match. But hey, when you go to war, I guess those types of things happen. So who am I to say that it was too early, right? If you're going to be in a cage with somebody doesn't take very long to ram their head into something and they start bleeding, and that's what happened to poor Dax Harwood. Sean Spears was in next for the pinnacle. He brought a chair. He is, after all, the chairman, right? He calls himself the chairman. He clobbered Sammy right in the head with the chair. It did not look like Sammy got his hands up in time. He tried, but he clobbered this guy right in the head. Not the only uh, chair shot to the head that we saw in this match. So uh, if that's your thing, then uh, you probably got a little tickle from this main event tonight. Ortiz was in next, and holy fucking shit, did the crowd come alive when Ortiz got into this ring? How fucking great was that? This is what I'm talking about. This is the, it's moments like that that really got you, got you into the match, right? Because the crowd, you could tell how amped up they were for this. When the babyface got into that cage... They were going nuts. They were ready to see Ortiz just tear into these guys. This crowd was on fire when this guy got into the ring. Sammy hit a Spanish fly. This was a pretty unique spot. So he leapfrogs up onto the top rope in ring number one. At the same time that Sean Spears jumps up onto the top rope in ring number two. Right? They're not the corners. They're right in the middle. And... They're struggling, and I think it was Ortiz threw a chair from behind, and it hit uh, Spears in the back. Sammy then jumped onto the top rope on ring two, or actually, I'm sorry, I think he brought Spears over to the top rope in the other ring, and from the top rope, did a Spanish fly. They did this a lot better than I just described it, but it was innovative. I don't think I've seen a Spanish fly spot like that, because 
you'd have to have two rings to do it. So really, you could only do that in a War Games match, and I don't recall ever seeing that in one of the NXT ones, so probably the first time I've seen that. Cash Wheeler was in next for the pinnacle. FTR hit an assisted Brain Buster to Ortiz with one half of uh, the Brain Busters watching out on the floor, that being uh, Tully Blanchard. Santana was in next for the Inner Circle. Wardlow made his entrance during one of the picture-in-picture, picture, one of the 84 picture-in-picture picture breaks it felt like we got in this match. Come on, T TNT. All you Turner executives that I'm sure are just watching this live, I'm sure you're watching me live right now. All these Turner executives, you knew that you were setting up for a big match like this. Couldn't you spring for, like, commercial-free? Or, not even commercial-free, but, like, set it up. Even if you have to front-load a lot of the commercials at the beginning of the show, the first, like, 45 minutes. So that, in the main event, in the second hour, you've got, like, two commercial breaks spread out. Even WWE has done that with some of the NXT shows, right? The first hour is commercial-free. Then again, I mean, they were probably, this is probably exactly what they were hoping for. They wanted commercials during this match. They knew that this match would give them the best shot of popping a big rating. They were probably, die they probably were disappointed they couldn't shove more commercials into this match. Anyway, Wardlow entered during the picture in picture. So they come back from break. And Jake Hager is in, and he's running wild like a big bull. He's just splashing guys in one corner, splashing guys in another corner. He hits a Vader bomb, a Hager bomb. It's a Vader bomb. Hits a Vader bomb to Wheeler. Ankle lock to Spears. But of course, all 10 men need to be in first because you can't get a submission if not everybody has entered the match. And then look who locks eyes with Jake Hager from across the other ring. It is Wardlow. And the two big men lock eyes. I thought they were going to embrace in the middle of the ring in a passionate, a passionate embrace. There were some uh, weird overtones between the two of them during some of those segments. If you remember Wardlow and Hager when they were doing the... It was actually... Comedy-wise, I actually enjoyed the stuff involving the two of them. But well, that was when MJF was in the inner circle. Wardlow instead comes into the other ring, and both guys start to slug it out. MJF is the final man in the ring, in the match, for the pinnacle, because of course he is. Of course he was always going to be last, and Tony Schiavone pointed that out. Tony Schiavone really plays up the fact that he does not like MJF on commentary. He comes into a chorus of boos. And he looks through the chain link fence outside the ring. Chris Jericho is the last man yet to come in. And MJF looks over at Jericho and says, when you get inside, you're a dead man. So he's already making threats to Jericho before Jericho is even in the ring. Cash Wheeler, he was even more bloodied up than his partner was. I don't know what happened to this guy, but he's just, you can't even see. His skin, just red, pouring down the man's face. All the Pinnacle members at one point had Santana isolated in the ring, in one of the rings, all by himself. But here comes the leader of the inner circle. Here comes Chris Jericho. And now we have all the Pinnacle members in one ring. We have all of the inner circle members in the other ring. The bell rings. It is now officially submission or surrender. Now the match is officially underway. And both teams are building up steam, and they both come to the center of the ring, and they, they it's like two, two warring factions, right? And they meet right in the middle, and they start going at it. Jericho had the baseball bat. He had Floyd in the ring with him. He starts teeing off on guys with it. We have another fucking commercial. We come back, and the inner circle hits an assisted spike pile driver to Cash Wheeler on the exposed canvas. During the commercial, they had ripped up part of the mat in one of the rings, in the corner, so they exposed the wooden boards underneath, and they spiked him headfirst right down on top of it. Sammy Guevara in the other ring, he goes coast to coast on Sean Spears, who is hung upside down in the corner. Hits the uh, coast to coast, drop kicks a chair right back into Spears' face. That pretty much took care of Sean Spears. MJF is busted open. Santana spikes him in the forehead with a fork, and then he licks the blood off the fork. 
still the nastiest thing I, I think I've, well, I don't know about ever, but one of the more repulsive things that I have seen in terms of, of blood, besides that uh, Eddie Guerrero blade job at Judgment Day that one year, it was a uh, Ring of Honor show. This is back during the, uh, oh God, what was the name of the faction that Jimmy Jacobs had? The, uh, the Fallen or whatever it was. Seth Rollins, back when he was Tyler Black, he was Age of the Fall or Age of the Fall. Age of the Fall. They had one of the Briscoes, I think it was Jay Briscoe, strung up, upside down, bleeding like a stuck pig, hanging above the ring. And Jimmy Jacobs stood underneath this guy and let the blood drip all over him as he was cutting his promo. And I, I, if I remember, he looked up, he opened his mouth so the blood would drip in his mouth. You gotta be a real sick fuck to do something like that. This wasn't uh, quite Jimmy Jacobs level here, but even still, taking a fork to somebody and then licking the blood off, the man is a savage. So Wardlow had a chance here to shine for a little bit. He was fighting off members all by himself. He was, you know, fighting off all the baby faces, going after Hager. They took him down with some weapon shots. We had another fucking break. This one felt like it came 90 seconds after the last one. So, you know, again, it's, it's not so much an issue of commercials. You know, you got to take ads. I get it. You know, I do the same thing. <laughs> Except... It's a little bit different on a podcast. It's not in the middle of a main event match, but even still, like, I get it. But just space them out a little bit differently. It felt like as the match went on, the breaks got closer and closer and closer. I don't know if that's AEW. I don't know if that's TNT that's responsible. For, probably TNT for, like, where the ads go. But I'm like, man, Excalibur was like, we promise this is the last one. Even he knew. He's like, we promise you we're going to take our last break here. So they go to commercial one last time. We come back and MJF has escaped the cage. They got possession of the key from Bryce Remsburg and they beat up Bryce Remsburg and MJF got out of the cage. He climbed up to the top. We see Chris Jericho climbing up after him. So Chris Jericho follows him to the top of the cage. MJF is up there. He's bloody. He's, he's battered. He's begging off. Chris Jericho puts him in the walls of Jericho. Very uh, ugly looking walls of Jericho. It looked like he was trying to squat and take a crap or something. MJF looks like he might tap out. You know, he's doing the fake out like he's going to tap. He's going to tap. Finally, he reaches back. And he gives Jericho a low blow. Punches him right in the nuts. Down goes Jericho. MJF locks on the salt of the earth. Armbar. Now Jericho is teasing that he might tap out. He's got nowhere to go. He's got no one. To, no, no one's there to save him. No one can break up the fall. They're all up there all by themselves. And Jericho's teasing it and teasing it. He refuses. MJF releases the hold. Now he starts biting Jericho's hand. And then he reapplies the arm bar. So he lets go again. He realizes this is not going to work. He lets go of the hold. And MJF puts on his dynamite diamond ring. And he nails Jericho with it right between the eyes. Knocks him down. Jericho comes up bleeding. Now MJF is looking down. Now you know where this is going. You know where this is going. He's looking down. His eyes are getting wide. We know he has evil intentions. Tony Schiavone calls MJF a no good, and I quote here, a no good piece of shit for what he is thinking of doing. He hasn't even done anything yet. And Tony Schiavone is calling him a no-good piece of shit. So MJF is looking down at the other members of the inner circle who have now escaped the cage as well. And he's telling them, he goes, surrender or I'm throwing them off. Right now. Either you surrender or he's taking a fall off the top of this cage. And they're begging him, don't do it, don't do it. You can hear Sammy Guevara down below say, we surrender. And with that, the pinnacle wins. The now, what did I say last week? This was actually the inverse of what I thought it would be. I thought it would be Jericho giving up and surrendering because the pinnacle was about to do something really heinous to Sammy. So Jericho would surrender to save Sammy. Instead, they did the opposite, where Sammy gave up to save Jericho. 
that I thought was kind of interesting. So the pinnacle wins, and I still knew exactly where this was going. And this I actually loved, the, the idea of it. Because they're really trying to sell, and they don't have to work very hard to do this, right? You just kind of know that MJF is a prick. But they really want you to hate him. They really want you to know this guy's an asshole. Even though they gave up and they gave him exactly what he wanted and MJF won the match, he's going to throw this guy off anyway. Now, before he did, it looked like they were stalling. I don't know what they were waiting for. I don't know why they were stalling so much. Clearly, they were stalling. And again, you talk about bad camera angles. The camera zooms in on Jericho as he's talking and having a conversation with MJF. Now, if I'm an announcer and I see this and it's so blatant on camera, it's very simple. Any one of those, any one of those three, you got three announcers on commentary, right? Excalibur, Tony Schiavone, Jim Ross. What is Jim Ross doing? All you have to do is go, look at Jericho. He's talking trash to MJF. If you could read lips, he just called MJF a prick. Something. Anyway, they're stalling, they're stalling, they're stalling. And finally, Jericho now stands up. He's in position. You know what's coming next. They're probably just waiting for... I, I don't know. He wasn't caught by anybody. So it's not like they were waiting for people to get in position. But finally, MJF shoves him backwards. Jericho crashes, I'd say, about 10 feet, maybe. Maybe 12. Off the top of the cage. Down through what clearly was designed to look like those metal grates. Like what the ring steps are made out of. But it was clearly cardboard. And even when they were tending to him and they were kind of bang, banging on it, it was cardboard. And I understand that you, you, know, you want to design it in a way where the performer is safe. I don't want them to just throw Jericho onto concrete and watch his fucking brains splatter out of his head. But as I said at the beginning of the stream, this was a killer. Because the way this was shot, it just completely takes you out of the moment. It just does. And it's a shame because I thought everything up until this point was really good. I mean, I dug the match. I thought it was a really fun match. It was chaotic. It was bloody. It was violent at different points. And I appreciate them following the classic traditional war games rules, which even WWE doesn't do. And I like those matches that they do. But they really try to, as much as possible, kind of replicate the, the rules and the format of the original. So I thought that the, they did a fine job on the match itself and everybody worked hard and they busted their ass and they took a lot of abuse and they bled and they bled some more. I thought the match was, was great. I have no issue with the match itself. My issue is with the big payoff at the end. And they say people remember how you start and how you finish. And they don't always remember the stuff that comes in the middle. And you're going to have a lot of people coming out of the show now who are like, oh, man. You know, I really like the blood and guts match, but man, that finish sucked. Man, that, that shove off the top, man. That looks so phony. That looks so weak. And it didn't have to be like that. All you need to do, all you need to do is zoom in on MJF and Jericho at the top of the cage, right? He got what he wanted. He's looking at Jericho. He's saying, Chris, thank you. And then he shoves him. And the camera can pan back a little bit, but all you see is Jericho fall out of camera view. And then two seconds later, you hear a boom. You hear a crash. And the announcers are losing their... Oh my God, I can't... Oh, oh my God, right? They're just reacting to it really big. But you don't actually see the impact. You don't actually see the... Fun. Now, you could always show a replay later on. But at least then, you can watch it and say, man, that looked bad. So we're not going to show that. Or if it looked great, fuck, let's show 15 replays. That's how you shoot something like that. Instead, at the very end of the show, after he was hanging around up on top for like 10 minutes, they had a shot of MJF looking down going, thank you. Because that was the big payoff at the end, right? If you remember back to their promo last week when they had the big parlay, MJF, what did he say he wanted? He wanted his spot. He wants Jericho's spot. He would thank him and then take his spot. And that's what he did. That's where the thank you comes from. But I don't know why they didn't do it where just he wins the match. Everybody thinks, all right, great. Chris Jericho's life has been spared. 
and he's helping Jericho to his feet. Chris puts his hand on his shoulder. Thank you. Boom. You don't show the imp. It's just such simple stuff. It could have avoided all of this. And now you're going to have a lot of people who, unfortunately, are just talking about how, ah, that was great until the very end. It's kind of like the Moxley Omega match of Revolution, right? A lot of people enjoyed that match. Man, that was great until the very end. And then it just goes over like a fart in church. So that was a, uh, a very underwhelming uh, conclusion there, unfortunately, to all of this. Medics came out to tend to Jericho. Uh, Dean Malenko was out there as well. You know, Dean Malenko has a history with Jericho. He works behind the scenes in AEW. He came out to check on him. And the final shot that we got was MJF on top of the cage, bloodied and victorious. So I will say that the outcome is exactly what it had to be. You know, you had to put some heat on the pinnacle. You had to have the heels go over. And it should have been MJF standing right there all by himself on top of that cage. And that was the money shot, and that's what we got at the very end. So, you know, they delivered on what they had to. But I just think the way in which they went about getting there was all wrong in terms of how things were shot and how things were, were handled at the very end with that big, dramatic, you know, sending him to his doom. That's, that's the unfortunate part, that you could have easily avoided that. So that was your big blood and guts match. But what do you guys think? Am I right in the way that I just kind of rebooked the ending? I just rebooked the uh, final shot of what we saw there at the end of the show. It seemed like a pretty simple thing to me. Could have avoided a lot of that, uh, a lot of those issues I just talked about. Next Wednesday, we have John Moxley defending the IWGP United States Championship against Yuji Nagata. We've got SCU challenging the Young Bucks for the AEW Tag Team Championship in what will be SCU's final match. So if you are an SCU fan, enjoy it, because it's not going to last much longer. Orange Cassidy, one-on-one -on -one against Pac in a world title eliminator. Miro takes on Darby Allin for the TNT title, and if Darby cannot compete, he will be forced to forfeit the championship, but, you know, Darby being the valiant underdog babyface is not going to forfeit. Come on. Can't do that. I mean, Shawn Michaels did that, actually. <laughs> Shawn Michaels, the great babyface that he was, actually vacated a whole bunch of championships. The friggin' puss. Gave one up to Dean Douglas. He gave one up in the middle of the ring instead of jobbing to Sid. Oh, my knee. My knee hurts. My knee. Darby is not going to stand there and let them take the championship away from him. He'll be pounded into the ground by Miro, and we're going to have a new TNT champion next week. Tony Schiavone is going to interview Jade Cargill. You know, somebody floated an interest, and I wish I knew who it was. Uh, one of you guys it was either in a tweet or an email uh, suggested when I was talking last week about all these managers who are recruiting Jade Cargill. Like she's Macho Man Randy Savage in 1985, and they all want to manage this woman. Speaking of Macho Man, I'm going to have a lot to say about that A&E documentary. You're going to want to tune into the sound off on Sunday. I'm going to have a whole review and a lot of thoughts about that documentary. You talk about polarizing. There's been a lot of talk about that. But when I was talking about all the managers looking to recruit her, I was trying to think like, all right, maybe Matt Hardy, but you know, I don't really think she needs a manager. I don't. I don't think she needs one. And then somebody messaged me and they said, what if uh, Thea Trinidad is signed with AEW? Because apparently she's signed somewhere. We don't know where. We don't know where she's going to end up. But what if Zelina Vega is coming to AEW and Jade rebuffs all of these other existing managers, and she brings in Zelina as her new manager. And I thought about that, and I said, you know, that would be cool. That I can get behind. Because that really is a, such a great role for Zelina, right? When she was with Andrade and Angel Garza, she was so good in that role. I would, I would get behind that, even though I still don't think Jade needs a manager, necessarily, but I, I could get behind that. And I hadn't really thought about that. So... 
I don't know what, uh, you know, is going to be the, if there's going to be a payoff or whatever in this interview next week, if we're going to find out that she found a manager and they're going to tease it out. You know what I could see? I could see Jade saying, you know what? I ha I found someone. I've made my choice. And at double or nothing, I'm going to reveal who my new manager is. And maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it is going to be Zelina Vega. Not under that name, obviously, but maybe it is going to be Zelina. And they'll do the big reveal at the pay-per-view. Paul Heyman in the chat says, Zelina needs Andrade. No, Paul, you have it backwards. Andrade needs Zelina. Zelina don't need no one. If anybody needs anyone, Andrade could definitely benefit from having her as his mouthpiece. So you've got, you've got it backwards there. And uh, Cody is going to make his double or nothing announcement. I'm sure that'll be the match with uh, a go-go. So a uh, pretty big lineup even for next week. Usually they have one week live, one week taped, and they alternate. I believe next week is live. So if somebody in the chat wants to look it up for me and confirm, I'm almost positive that next week's show is a live show. I think they're going live two weeks in a row. Uh, it's certainly shaping up to be another pretty stacked edition of, uh, of the show next week. Got some championship matches, so I dig it. You always want to make the show feel important, right? That's always very important. Well, we've got over 1,400 votes already in for the Blood and Guts edition of Dynamite. 80.6% thumbs up, 19.4% thumbs down. Epsilon Sama says Andrade, a.k.a. La Sombra, is great on the mic in Spanish. Well, that's great for him in Mexico. But uh, anywhere else, he would benefit from having Zelina as his mouthpiece. I, I, I don't doubt that he's charismatic. I think that's great. He could have charisma oozing out of his pores. But Zelina don't need Andrade. So my point was, of those two, I would say that uh, he could use her a lot more than she can use him. She don't need him. Still irritates me that they were broken up in the first place. There was no need for that. There was no need to break them. But you know what? I could say that about so many teams in that company over the last uh, six months or nine months. It's ridiculous. We had another one on Monday night, right? With Cedric and Shelton. Let's just, let's just break people up for no reason. Here's a breakup for no reason I could get behind. Vince McMahon in WWE. It's never going to happen. But uh, that would be kind of funny if it did, right? The ultimate irony. The board has ousted Mr. McMahon. Can't happen, but... Boy, would that be a story for me to cover here on the podcast. The board has spoken. All righty. All righty. What is going on here? I got to change the color intensity on this, uh, on this camera here. I'm all red. I'm like Eva Marie. All red everything. I talk about her on uh, Sunday as well. Episode 703. Going to be a very interesting podcast. But right now, we are talking about Blood and guts. And I want to hear from you guys. So, and we got a lot of super chats. I like it. I like it. Let's go back to Manny D. He was the first person to send in a super chat. Manny, thank you, man. Manny is a member of the channel as well. I don't know if Manny is a... Is a Sound off uh, superstar level tier or legends tier. But you are a legend in my book, sir. Uh, off leather wings. Off leather wings. Anthony, wake me up before you go a go go. Oh, come on. Nayef Alsafar, thank you for the 10 bucks. Always good to hear from Nayef each and every week. We've got I am the table. 
I am the tail. Oh, you know what? Before we even get into all your, your super chats, we should do uh, ratings predictions for tomorrow. So Dynamite was down last week. I think everything was pretty much down last week uh, on that night. Even that show, The Challenge. What is that, by the way? I hear about that every week, The Challenge. It's a reality show, I assume. What is it? I literally don't know what it is. I've never watched it. I don't know who hosts it. I don't know what the premise of the show is. I don't know why it's so popular. It's always number one. Every week in the ratings, it's always number one. I see this show. Even The Challenge was down last week because of that Biden address at 9 o'clock. So you can kind of throw that number away. This is going to be a major, major, major test for AEW because there was nothing else going on tonight. It was Cinco de Mayo. Who cares? It's not Halloween. It's not like a big, 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 big holiday where you're going to have half their audience going out and, and partying. So there's no excuses. We're going to see. They've been promoting this match now for weeks. This is a pay-per-view-esque main event that they have been promoting. Right, blood and violence and, and and two rings and one cage. If they can't pop a big number with this show, that is not good. So they did 1.2 million a few weeks ago. Honestly, if they can't pull 1.3, I think that would be pretty pretty disappointing. If they can't pull 1.3 million people this week on a blood and guts main event that they've been building up for a month, I would consider that to be a disappointment. But of course, it's not just about the overall number, it's about the demo. So if they come in number one or two in the demo, that's what TNT is going to care about. But me, I still, I still like looking at that overall number. It's just a nice big number. Everybody always gravitates to the overall number, even though it is not the most important number. But I'm going to say 1.3 million. You guys let me know what your prediction. What is your prediction? I don't want, I don't want to know what you think, what you want the show to get. What do you think the show will do in the overnight numbers tomorrow? When those numbers are released, do they break a million? And if so, by how much? That's what I want to know from you guys. Let's get some predictions going here. I am the table with the $5 super chat. Might not make it live, but I wanted to send my support and ask you this. John Cena versus Roman Reigns next year at WrestleMania. What are your thoughts? Um, you know, we had the one match between them at that paper was no mercy, maybe a few years ago. You know, there's a story there. Cena has never been universal champion before. I guess that would count towards his overall number of titles. So you can do the whole Cena goes for number 17 story. I certainly wouldn't have him win. I would not have John Cena be the one to beat Roman Reigns. If, if the idea is for Cena to beat Roman, then absolutely not. Absolutely not. But would that be an attraction? Of course. Of course it would be. Especially if Cena doesn't really wrestle until then. But, you know, you'd have to explain how is he getting a championship. He would have to win the Rumble or something. So is it an attraction that you can do? Yeah. But not a match where uh, I would want Roman to lose. And now, and now you're getting into, like, back-to-back -back WrestleManias. You will get to a point where he's got to lose. He's going to run through everybody. He's got to lose at some point. Uh, so maybe that is a, a good reason to, to do a different match where, you know, he might uh, drop the title to somebody else full-time on the roster. Maybe he's not even the champion by WrestleMania. Maybe it's a, a non-title match next year between Cena and Roman. You know, then you can pretty much do whatever you want. I still wouldn't have Roman lose. Title or not, I would not have him lose that match. Mr. Rob 23 or 323. Mr. Rob 323 is a sound off legend, which now gives you access to the lost episodes of the podcast. That is all of the shows that predate things that you can find on Podbean. So the first 84 episodes of the show, they're not all up. I'm gradually going through the back catalog and getting them uploaded. The first six episodes of the Sound Off, by the way, from 2007 are now up. Episode six went up a few days ago. If you are on the Legend tier, you have access to that audio. So, uh, Mr. Rob, thank you very much. Duff's Vid says 950,000 to a million. Well, that would be a big letdown. 950K for Blood and Guts? Yeah, that, that would not be good.
Lord Frieza. My little girl has a fever, so I won't make it. I hate picture in picture, but I love showing love to the stream. So I hope she feels better. Hopefully uh, she feels better uh, by tomorrow. And uh, thank you to Lord Frieza, as always, for your super chat support. Nathan Caddy, and my first dose of the vaccine is really kicking my ass, but I'm still here to show some love for the Sala Monster. Blood and guts rule. So Nathan was a big fan of the main event tonight. It's interesting, your first dose kicked your ass. It was the second one that knocked me for a loop. Uh, but then a day later, I was uh, good to go. So at least we know, we, at least I know it worked, right? The True Heel Master says 1.9 million. Now, well, clearly the True Heel Master has been drinking tonight. So basically, you're saying that you think Dynamite is going to beat Raw. Is that what you, that's what you're saying to me? You're saying that Dynamite is going to beat Monday Night Raw. This, this there would be an eruption at Titan Tower if the numbers come in tomorrow and they are higher than Monday Night Raw. That is absolutely not going to happen. That is not going to happen. But it's good to be optimistic. TH Revolution with the 12 bucks. I know I don't speak for everyone, but Blood and Guts really disappointed me after all the buildup. Felt like it never really got going and the finish was dreadful. Liked the rest of the show, though. So TH, not a fan. Not a fan of uh, Blood and Guts. Anani Moose. <laughs> Thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that. It makes me laugh for some reason. He is, uh, he is Anani Moose. Uh, Suriz Manson, do you think Jim Cornette and Brian Alvarez will be the best Raw commentary team for the recent Raw episodes? Also, do... Oh, also, you always make my thank you. I think he said make my day. No, I mean, uh, look, you know, me and JD, we, we've done the commentary in the past for uh, House of Glory. That would be an interesting Raw show. He and I doing the raw commentary on one of these three-hour dreadful programs. If we were able to let loose and do the commentary the way that we want to do the commentary, the way that I certainly would do commentary for that show, we wouldn't last... Forget one week. I don't think we would last one show. <laughs> we would be replaced midway through the episode. They would grab anybody they could get their hands on in the back and just throw them out there. I would give that show the commentary it deserves. Quintus Brown, the match delivered. So Quintus was a, uh, a big fan of Blood and Guts. Team Forward with the $4. The main event was good until a predictable ending. Uh, the True Heel Master, MJF wins. Fatality. All seriousness, AEW Blood and Guts lives up to the hype. Great job. All Elite Wrestling. Ryan Spies, I think MJF and Sammy should have had mics for the end at least, but otherwise, great match. Uh, Griga with the five. Hey, Solomon, sir, I listened to your podcast at work and loving it. Keep up the good work. Any thoughts on John Arezzi's new book? If you have not, I recommend it. You know, I, I probably should. I have not. Uh, picked it up. I have heard about it, and uh, Arezzi has been around forever. I mean, he's been around for ages and ages. He's got lots of stories to tell. Uh, has a rep, I think, for being a, you know, on the up and up. Nice guy. So I will uh, probably have to put that on my list, but I have not checked it out, so I, I cannot comment on it. Josh Citrone. First hour was taped. Tony said he would give us $20 tickets for next week. I was there. So there you go. Josh was at the show. Yeah, I mentioned that earlier that you guys had to watch the first hour, I think, on screens. Or on the big screen. And I think you guys are the ones who provided the audio for those matches. So even though the matches were taped last week, the crowd noise we heard tonight, I believe, was from the live audience at Daly's Place. Uh, Ali Nadim, uh, Darby and Jericho was a tale of two spots. Yeah, yes, it was. Both very, very dumb for very different reasons. But yes, two very uh, different 
spots, uh, indeed. Uh, Matthew, uh, $6 super chat, good show. Main event delivered the violence this match needed, but I really wish they held this match until double or nothing because those breaks took me out. Magician Sapphire with the uh, $10. I love the main event and the show overall in spite of the commercials and that finish at the end. AEW needs to do better with their camera work. Matthew, uh, let's see here. Al would have taken Jericho's bump, not Darby's. Who's Al? Al who? Al Bundy? <laughs> I don't know. What, what Al are you talking about? You've got to specify, my friend. You've got to specify. Chris Quillman. I know it's fresh. But where do you think the Blood and Guts match ranks with the NXT? Oh, I, I, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't tell you. I would need time to process, or I'd have to go back and watch the old ones from a few years ago. But this one, is it's up there. I don't know that I would put this in, in first place, but this one, it's, it's definitely not at the bottom. It's probably closer to the top somewhere, but maybe not at the very top, but I, I'd have to go back and... It would be unfair to kind of put me on the spot and ask me to give you a legit answer when uh, I don't remember everything that happened. I mean, there were some women's war games matches that WWE did that I also uh, remember enjoying. The one where Rhea ended up being the... Uh, I don't think she was the sole survivor, but I think she won the uh, women's war games for her team. That was maybe in 2019, maybe. Or maybe it was the beginning of last year. Uh, Food High. Early to the party. Love the feel of the show tonight. I love this company. By the way, I am 28 now, baby. So everybody wish Food Hive a very happy 28th birthday. Jared says Al Wilson. Oh, Al Wilson would have dropped. He would have just... <laughs> he would have just dropped right down on the, uh, on the floor would have fallen from a, a great height. Epsilon Sama. Sad no Brian Danielson versus Omega announcement. Why, why do people think that that was going to be a thing? Where did this get started? I want to know where this got started. Whatever website you heard that from, I will command you to never go to that website ever again. I want to know where people are getting this. I saw this constantly on social media tonight. Brian is going to make an appearance. Daniel Bryan might show up on Dynamite. Daniel Bryan is not going anywhere. Daniel Bryan, his contract apparently just expired. Now, wherever he's going to end up, it's going to be a little while before we see him there. Daniel Bryan was not going to be on Dynamite tonight. He was never going to be on Dynamite tonight. And he's not going to be there next week either. I don't know why people thought, thought that. And then they'll turn around now that the show is over and they'll be disappointed because there was no Brian Danielson. Well, it's your own fucking fault for reading dumb shit from places that you should not be reading. I could have told you. He was not going to be on the show tonight. So I don't know where people are getting this from. Anyway, Epsilon... That's my uh, overall rant on these uh, places that are giving uh, false information, not on you. He was never going to be there, though. He said the bump was too fake. Also, I had booked this, but I would have had Sammy throw Jericho for that swerve, bro. Well, you can't really do that because we already had a swerve with MJF. I mean, you're not going to be swerving back and forth. You know, it's then you'll just look like Tammy Sitch on the road. So you can't be swerving back and forth like that. Uh, Joe Cool 82. Cody against QT Marshall was the best match of the night. Well, that is certainly an opinion. Thank you, Joe. Rodimus Prime with that $40 super chat from earlier. Got off work late, so I'm pissed I missed blood and guts, but I'm sure it was incredibly awesome. And we've got uh, Jared again. Thank you for that $75 drop earlier. You are the king of uh, the Super Chats tonight. 
So, Jared, thank you. Hulkling93, what took me out was how forever it took in the main event end. Me and my brother were just saying, um, Jericho, do something already. It, yeah, it's like what I said before. I mean, I just was just talking about that before. It's like, I don't know why they were stalling. I don't know what was going on down below. They weren't shooting anything down below. And they're just kind of trying to kill time. And yeah, when you zoom in on Jericho and you clearly show him communicating with MJF, that really is on the announcers to chime in and say, oh, shit, we better cover for that. And it's so easy to just pipe in and say, look at Jericho. Did you see that? Jericho talking trash to MJF. He just told him what a, you know, a dirty little prick he is. Whatever. Gotta think on your feet. These guys are pros. I mean, they've been doing it for decades. I don't... I mean, they're seeing what we're seeing in their monitors. So, again, I don't know why they wouldn't just try to uh, improvise in that spot and try to cover for that. I mean, that's just bad camera work in that case. Uh, 561 Mexico. Take a shot every time Solomonster says, I told you so, about Britt Baker. I will continue to tell you that I told you so about Britt Baker, because Britt Baker is the correct choice to challenge Sheeta for the championship. And I had so many people telling me, Thunder Rosa, it's going to be Thunder Rosa. Really? Please tell me more. Please. I would love to hear it. Roderick Welch is uh, up next on the list here. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Roderick Welch, let me uh, make sure you guys can see. Here we go. Actually, before we get to Roderick, uh, Steve Free, uh, Stephen Fees. Let's start with Stephen here. $5 super chat. Uh, let's see here. Talk about ExpressVPN. Should use it and pay the $5 a month for AW on Fight. Sound is better. There's no picture in picture. There's no NBA audio. Well, that was only one week. You need to treat yourself. Well, Steven just gave me a great opportunity to remind people that you, in fact, if you wanted to avoid the commercials on this uh, show tonight, you could have done just that. You could use ExpressVPN. And if you do, you can get an extra three months free. ExpressVPN.com slash Solomonster, you see? I got you covered. I got you covered on Amazon Music. I got you covered on VPNs. Whatever you need, you come to me, and I'll guarantee you, I probably got a link and a code for it. <laughs> so I can get you some free months. Or a free whatever, a free week. Thank you, Steven, for uh, giving me the chance there for that plug. I would have forgot. Uh, Dirk McCullough. It looked... Like Wheeler hit an artery. It did. I didn't even see how it happened. Uh, NS Andrew, you better respect the masterpiece, Solomonster. Yeah, he kind of flamed out, didn't he? But now he's back. He's in the NWA as uh, Chris Adonis. Chris Masters, now Chris Adonis. You see, he's an example of someone, unfortunately, very young at that time, who was just pushed too much too soon. And then they gave up on him. They actually brought him back. He had improved and gotten better, and they completely gave up on him again. It's unreal. Unreal. B.W. Rojas, or Roses, I'm sorry, Roses. $5 Super Chat. Now Chris Jericho and AEW are going to have to cover that fall of Chris's up or tell it like it is or work it into the story, just like with the death match. There's no way to explain it. How do you explain it? You know, the botch at Revolution, they easily were able to explain by saying, well, the heels wanted to just make us think the ring was going to explode and then point and laugh and mock us, which is basically what they did. How do you explain away what we saw there with that bump at the, at the very end. If you thought it looked bad, there's no way to cover for it. There's no way to explain it. <laughs> there really isn't. Ken terminated by DQ. Uh, thank you for the $5. 
I bet even Mick Foley cringed after seeing Darby falling down the stairs. Does Foley stair bump from Orton get a pass, and why? What do you mean get a pass? I don't... Mick Foley did a lot of dumb shit in his career. <laughs> I've called him out on all the dumb shit that he did. You know, especially taking those chair shots from The Rock. I know he wasn't planning on taking that many of them. That's, that's on The Rock, but... Who, who's giving Mick Foley a pass, I'd like to know. I wasn't doing a podcast in 2004, or else I would have been calling him out on that too. So I don't know. I'd love to know what podcasters are giving him a pass. Because uh, nobody I know has ever given Mick Foley a pass for some of the stupid shit that he's done. Food Hive, I just know that on the night of Cinco de Mayo, you did not eat cereal for dinner. I feel tonight is the night for no cereal. Am I correct, good sir? In fact, you are. You are correct. And uh, I won't tell you what I had just because uh, I'm waiting until next week. I'm actually working with a new sponsor. We have a, uh, a, new, a new advertiser coming to the sound off in a couple of weeks. And I'm actually really excited about this. Uh, and I, I got... Uh, I had the chance, finally, to uh, cook with it prepare a, uh, a meal for myself tonight that turned out really well and it was really good and you're all going to have the same chance very, very soon. So I will tell you all about that uh, not this weekend, but next weekend. So but yes, it was not cereal. It was actual food. Healthy food. Good food that I was able to have tonight. Pork, in fact. We had some good pork for dinner. Uh, the True Heel Master with the $5. Thank you. Uh, did anyone notice a fly or a mosquito was on Kenny Omega's white tuxedo during his segment? If not, watch it again and look very closely. The thing is moving. I don't care enough to do that, so I will take your word for it. <laughs> I'm not going to go back and study Kenny Omega's attire to see if I see a fly or a mosquito. But I will take your word that, in fact, he had a bug on him. And uh, I don't know what else to say to that, but... You, you have the very astute observations uh, here on this, on this stream. Whatever I miss, I could always rely on the true heel master to pick up the slack. EJ Slemp, can you name three or four must-watch War Games matches from WCW? Oh, I can give you a few. And in fact, if you could go back uh, right here on the YouTube channel, if you look under the playlists, because I've created a whole bunch of playlists on the channel, I believe there is one dedicated to what I... Uh, put together on my list years ago of the top uh, 15 matches in WCW history. And there were at least a couple of War Games matches on there. One of them is the one from 92. I think that was the one with uh, Sting Squadron against the Dangerous Alliance. So I'll give you that one right now. Uh, I'd have to think about the other ones. I think there's another one or two on that list, though. So definitely go back and check that out. But the, the one with Sting Squadron and the Dangerous Alliance, I think that was 1992. That might have been the best one they've ever done. So that's the one. If I told you, hey, go watch that, that's the one that I would tell you to go back and watch. BW. No, Food Hive, it is not Blue Apron. It is not Blue Apron. It's better than Blue Apron. It's not Blue Apron. BW says, but after the sneak attack tonight, Mox and Kingston might cost the Bucks the belt to SCU. It would make sense, unless they're saving that for double or nothing. You see, I, uh, it's possible. Yeah, I mean, it's possible. I wouldn't do that, though. Put the belts on SCU? Yeah. You know, there is a story you could do where... If SCU were to win the tag team titles, Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky have been aligned. There's a history there with Scorpio Sky and SCU. You could do a tag team title, or you could build to a tag team title match with SCU then dropping the belts. They could be transitional champions. Drop the belts to Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky. Get that little bit of history there with Scorpio. To me, though, it would almost be like a step back for Scorpio Sky. He was doing the tag team thing, and he broke away from SCU. What would the point be if he just ended up in another in another team? So that that's the one part of it I kind of 
don't like, it's almost, it's like a lateral move for him. You, you always want to move up. You don't want to just go from like here to here, right? You want to go up. I don't, I don't know that that really does him a world of good. So uh, I'm hoping the Bucks don't drop the belts uh, next week. I would rather see John Moxley and Eddie Kingston have a little run as the tag team champions. I think it could be fun. I want to see them stay together for a while. Uh, Taylor E. with the $15 Super Chat. Look at that. No message, just love and support. I love it. Taylor, thank you, man. 15 bucks. That's awesome. Spanish Goddish, what did you think of the Tessa rumor? I think the fact that I said nothing about it on my show this weekend should tell you everything that you need to know about what I thought of that rumor. BW, so when do you think Don Callis will betray Omega? Boy, you are a wrestling fan. As soon as people get together, when is, when is this guy going to betray this guy? When's this girl going to turn on this guy? Man, I would hate to be a wrestler. I'd be doing nothing but looking over my shoulder every 10 seconds. Making sure I don't have a knife in my back. It's no wonder the macho man was so paranoid. Jacob Donnelly... With the $30 Christian Cage Super Chat from earlier. Jacob, thank you. I thought Blood and Guts delivered. Despite the anticlimactic ending, the red-hot crowd and the intensity were enough for me to leave on a positive note. Skull Dipper, 125. Just got off work and needed to tune in. Yes, you did. And I'm glad to have you. Justin Konglang with the $4 Super Chat. Alex Jimenez with the 7 bucks. If you don't give me your thoughts on that last Negan episode, then I will give you blood and guts, Sala Monster. Well, see, I was not aware of the fact that the Negan episode from a few weeks ago of The Walking Dead was the, I guess, mid-season finale. I just thought I was three weeks behind. So I watched it, and then I was like, oh shit, <laughs> the season's over. Um, I watched it. I loved it. I thought it's one of the best episodes they've ever done. If you are somebody who has fallen out of The Walking Dead in recent years, this was, in my opinion, a, a, a top five episode for the entire series. All 11 seasons, 10 or 11, whatever it's been, 10 or 11 seasons so far. It was a flashback episode to the background of the Negan character and where... You know, Lucille was his wife and where that all came from. Great fucking episode. I loved it. So I'm glad. To, I don't know if it was Alex or who it was who told me, man, you're going to want to really watch that show. You weren't kidding. That was some awesome, awesome storytelling. Maz, I see Maz in the chat. Hey, Solo. Hey, what's going on, Maz? Where do you think Brian is going? I think Brian is going home. I think Brian wants to be with his kids and his wife. And then he's going to think about where he wants to go next. I think he wants to go everywhere. He can have a match here. He can have a match there. He can have a match in this country. He can have a match in that country. He can go to Mexico. He can go to Japan. If he truly is a free man, then he's pretty much free to do whatever he wants to do. But I don't see him rushing into anything. There's no reason to rush. But I find it very, very interesting that Brian Danielson, Samoa Joe, and CM Punk, and you may think Punk's not coming back, but still, Brian, Joe, and Punk are all free agents at the same time. If I'm a promoter, I got the gears going right now. Okay, how could I put this together? There, there's something there. I can make money with this. How can we put something together? All three of them, free agents. Godzilla Hawk. Inner circle against the Pinnacle. Stadium Stampede. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. This was, this was it. This was it. There's nowhere else to go. This was the climax. There's just no need for it. If they go to a stadium stampede and the inner circle gets their win back, then what was the fucking point of any of this? Right? Like you don't you don't need to do that. So I would not 
at all. I would not do that. There's no need for that. You know, plus also, you got to keep in mind, when they did that match last year, they basically had like no crowd. Now they're going to have a full capacity crowd. 5,000 people are going to be inside Daly's place. They're not going to take their main event and take all 10 guys and put them in a football stadium next door in front of no fans. So to me, the stadium stampede was a great gimmick as a one-time thing during the pandemic era. I don't see them doing it again. At least not this year. Uh, flame... F uh, ugh. Easy for me to say. Flame Thrower Fluff Salisbury. One of my favorite Super Chat names. I think Sammy became a bona fide star tonight. He will go for revenge against MJF. Exactly. That's the story. That should be the story coming out of this match now. Sammy could be your hot young baby face going after the hot young heel in the company, right? This is what this company should be building to. You should be building to matches involving Darby and MJF and Hangman Page and Sammy. These are your, your AEW originals. These are the guys. That would be a great idea. That would be a great match for double or nothing. MJF one-on-one -on -one against Sammy Guevara. True Heel Master, Santana and Ortiz are 0-2 with the Dead President's War Paint in AEW. It's kind of like uh, the people who get the live music entrance at WrestleMania, right? They usually don't do very well. Oz and Glorious with the five bucks. Been in the ICU with COVID since last Wednesday. Oh, shit. Wow. Just got home. Missed the show, but so happy to be here with you all. Wow, I did not know that. Oz and Glorious. Holy shit. He's been in the hospital for a week with COVID. Well, the fact that you are home now tells me, I hope, that you are doing a lot better. And I hope it stays that way. That is very scary. Man, you don't want to get COVID now and end up in the hospital. I mean, you know, that'd be like, you know, spiking the ball at the one yard line. I mean, we've come so close. I don't want to hear about that. You got to stay healthy. So uh, everybody send, send their thoughts to uh, Oz and Glorious. Send positive vibes to Oz and Glorious. And I'm glad to hear you're doing well. Wow, that is scary. Abdul Rahman, well, let me talk to you, Jason. I'm formerly known as The Rock, and now I am L.A. Knight. I can't see him now. Yeah, it's exactly what I said. Was I right or was I right when I said that two or three years ago on the podcast? I can't. He's a really good promo. He is. Eli Drake, L.A. Knight. He's got charisma, he can talk, but I, I, his mannerisms, the way he speaks, his cadence, he tr he's the rock. He may not even realize he's doing it. He's a combination of the rock and Austin, and I can't not hear it every time he speaks. He, he needs to just try to, somehow to get away from that. He's a naturally charismatic guy. He's a great, very articulate. He's a great talker. But it's like he's trying to be The Rock. Uh, Anti-EM Bishop with the $10. Love your streams. I see NXT Die Hard scrapping on the Blood and Guts match. You hate to see it. What is your favorite War Games match? Probably the one I mentioned a few minutes ago. The one with uh, Sting Squadron against the Dangerous Alliance. Excellent match. That may, that was easily one of the best WCW matches of that year. I don't want to say the best, because Sting and Vader, I think it was in 92 at Starcade, right? King of Cable final. Had a, a friggin' fantastic match. You know, WCW in 92, you know, even part of 93, they had some great matches. They had some real talent there. They had Rick Rude, they had Sting, Vader, Flair had come back. You know, Austin was there. Pillman. Steamboat. Is Barry Windham still around? I think at that point he was. They had some great talent there in that company back then. Business might not have been great, but Steiners. Steiners were there. 
Well, I mean, 93 they weren't, but I think in 92 they still were. Uh, King of Doug style. Uh, with the $5, no sting and no fade to black brawl. Finally, also, friendly reminder to hit that like button down below. Yes, please hit that like button before you leave tonight. We had a lot of people, we had over a thousand people in here before. There's really no reason we shouldn't hit 500, but for whatever reason, it's always a struggle to get people to like these videos. So please hit that thumbs up. Dr. NXT Scorpio, let me be the first of many to say thank you, TNT, for the unwanted ad breaks during the main event. Uh, let's see here. Dr. NXT Scorpio, again, you sold me on the way they should have done the Jericho spot at the end of the match better than AEW did. I it was such an easy way to go. I don't even know why they didn't think of doing it. Having him say thank you first and then shove him. Instead of shoving him and then five minutes later saying thank you. That, that's the way that it should have been done. But then you just show him falling. You don't show the impact. You just show him fall. Leave it up to the people's imagination. I think it's one of the reasons why. Yeah, I'm a big horror fan and... Halloween, the original Halloween, is still my favorite movie. And there are parts in that movie, it, it's not a lot of just sort of blatant, let's show people getting sliced and diced, right? Like, you get that in a lot of movies, and, and that's fine, but it's, it's sort of the anticipation of the moment. And then there are times where things happen off camera and you don't see it, or maybe you just hear it, and they leave it up to your imagination. And there is something to be said for that, to not necessarily show us the moment of impact, especially if you know, like, you're not filming a movie. You have to just do things live in a way that, you know, you don't have that luxury when you're doing a live wrestling show. So yeah, you're going to have to set up a cardboard box for someone to fall on, but there are ways to do it where you don't have to shoot the moment of impact and make it so obvious. And I just don't understand. And WWE does this sometimes also. I don't understand why they don't think about that and sort of visualize that and plan ahead for stuff like that. It's just, I, I, I don't know. I don't know why I'm thinking of it and they're not. Vitamin Vision TV with the $10 super chat. You're very passionate tonight. I, too, notice a lot of AEW's botches and or misfires, but I'm lenient towards them because it's still a fresh product, and I guess they're still learning as they go. BW makes you wonder if TNT is trying to sabotage AEW as we get closer towards the 2023-24 expiration. No. You're, you're smarter than that. That's not happening. Why would they try to sabotage their own show? Two years in advance. <laughs> it's the complete opposite. They're expecting a big number tonight, and they want to shove as many ads in as possible because they expect a big demo number and a big overall number. There, there's no sabotage going on here. Not intentional, anyway. Uh, the True Heel Master. Tonight I was having rice and chicken burrito with a Corona beer bottle while watching Blood and Guts. Happy Cinco de Mayo, everyone. Paul Heyman with the $5 Super Chat. In the history segment, I thought you were going to cover the R-Truth heel turn from April 2011 where he beat up John Morrison and was smoking live on Raw. I cannot possibly cover every single event in wrestling history. So I prioritize the ones that I want to cover. And there are certain ones that I simply do not have time to cover. I'm sure that was one of many I simply did not cover last week. I do the best I can. I'm not perfect, but I do the best I can. Mr. Wombat, I was at the show. I've been drinking. I also think the show will do over 1.9 million. How would you feel if it did? I, I think I would be stunned. I really would be. I really would be. Because I don't think there are that many AEW fans. On a given Wednesday night, 
that are going to be tuned into TNT. I, I don't think they're there yet. And so for them to go from what they do last week, 1.1, or they, no, they were down below a million, right? They were back in the uh, 800,000 range. To shoot back up and to shoot up by over a million people would be inconceivable to me. That is not a number I think that is attainable uh, this week. I just don't see it. I don't see there being any chance of that. Now, if it happened, I would happily eat crow, and I would be very happy for AEW. That would be a fantastic sign. I would love to be a fly on the wall at Titan Tower if that happened. But I don't see that happening. Uffman Entertainment. Can't wait for your review on Sunday for SmackDown to hear you sing the original SmackDown theme song so I could put it as my ringtone. I'm telling you, the original SmackDown song is still the best song. It's great. I love it. 561 Mexico was there live. Such a damn good show from beginning to end. Sounded like that crowd was hot all night, especially for that main event. BW ratings prediction, 1.4 million viewers for tonight. I think that's a realistic number. I think that's more realistic than uh, 1.9 million. As uh, Nakamura dances on my super chats, Atkins Issa, thank you for subscribing. Yeah, do hit that sub button if you haven't already done so. We're trying to climb up to 63,000. I can't get there without you hitting that sub button. So if you want to help me get there faster, please subscribe. And if you want to become a member, we are... Actually, I think we might have broken 100 members tonight. <laughs> I think we may have already broken it, but we were so close. We're so close to our first big milestone. I only opened memberships a month ago. And uh, we, we either crossed 100 tonight or we're about to. So I'm pretty happy about that. And uh, again, I can't get there without you. So please consider becoming a member. You get some cool perks. Uh, Scorpio Sky's well-trimmed beard with the $5 super chat. Al Cowlins. That might be the Al that uh, he was talking about earlier. Wasn't he the one who was driving OJ in the Bronco? <laughs> Is that Al Cowlins? Chris Quillman. What is your Cinco de Mayo drink? I don't really have a Cinco de Mayo drink. If I were drinking on Cinco de Mayo, which I didn't do, um, although for some reason the ca the camera said I would would lead you to believe otherwise, I'm so red, my God, it looked like I I've, I'm probably about five drinks in tonight. Uh, if I was drinking, I, I probably would. I mean, my standard go to is usually Jack and Coke, and if I'm gonna jazz it up a little bit, honestly, I mean, I'd probably go for just a friggin' mojito or something. <laughs> I'm a very simple guy. I'm a very simple guy. I don't, I don't overcomplicate things. Roderick Welch with the $10 Super Chat. Uh, I was there tonight. Wish I would have known half the show was pre-taped. And that ending. What the fuck? It didn't translate in the building. We were confused. It probably seemed great on TV. Uh, no, it actually didn't, unfortunately. But it's interesting to get that first live perspective from somebody who was there who has the same thoughts that I did about that ending. Uh, they zoomed in on that, and it was very obvious that Jericho landed on a crash pad, cardboard, you know, whatever it was, and it just didn't look good. So, clearly I'm not the only one who felt that way. Mr. Wombat, that Tammy Sitch dig, 10 out of 10. Hey, these things just come to me. It was very mean, but uh, I can't help what comes out of my mouth. It hits my brain. It comes out of my mouth. And hey, sometimes you get caught in the line of fire. That's what happens, you know? Uh, the True Heel Master. I would love to see Sheeta against Britt Baker in a street fight at Double or Nothing, just like last year. But Britt goes over. You know what? I think they over they overdo the stipulations too much. And I wouldn't do that. I would just have a straight match. I think you got to kind of cool it. We've had a lot of that recently. We've had a lot of false count anywhere. You know, the lights out match with her and Thunder Rosa. 
blood and guts tonight. Every week, there's some kind of a, maybe like, or every other week, like a hardcore style match. I would, I would, unless there's a need for it, and in this case, I don't think there is, I would just have a straight wrestling match. Because if they have a rematch, maybe in June, then you can make it like a no disqualification match. Uh, Natural Born Thriller. Uh, what if Famous B ends up being Jade's manager? I love Famous B. I don't know if Famous B is still listening, but if he is, shout out to Famous B. I saw some uh, Lucha Underground related news tonight regarding MLW that I am very excited to go and uh, look deeper into. I only saw it before I came on live, so I don't know all the details yet. I, I don't watch MLW week to week. But uh, apparently there was a big reveal at the end of their MLW Fusion finale. This I think this was like their season finale uh, tonight. The full MLW Fusion episode is up on their YouTube channel. I plan on uh, checking it out tomorrow. I'm very excited by what I heard. This this could this could get me to start tuning in. So uh, we're gonna have to go when we're done here. I'm gonna have to go back and check that out. But uh, I was very excited by what I by what I read before I came on the air live. Ken terminated with the five dollars. You won't like the crazy spots that Terry Funk or Dreamer took. Uh, solo, you might faint over Mahoney going through many flaming tables from the Dudleys. Oh, I've seen it, I, or I've seen the highlights and the clips and stuff from the old ECW. So I'm I'm well aware of the really crazy shit they did. New Jack. Isn't the uh, the Vic Grimes thing, right? That wasn't ECW, but Vic Grimes almost killed a guy. Or was he the one who was almost killed? Off the scaffold. That's that that is probably I don't know that I've ever seen anything more just insane on such a stupid level and in a criminal level than that Vic Grimes spot. That was attempted murder as well. Actually, that was New Jack. That's what it was. It was New Jack throwing him off. It was Vic Grimes taking the bump. He almost died. That was payback for what Vic Grimes did to him in ECW. Of course it was New Jack. I said attempted murder. I should have figured it was fucking New Jack. That is still the craziest thing I've ever seen. Spanish Goddess, you ever went to Universal Studios Halloween Horror Nights? Unfortunately, I have not. I've been to Universal Studios, but I was never there for the uh, Halloween stuff. Or was I? No. Uh, the True Heel Master, do you see AEW doing a second Blood and Guts match at the Newark, New Jersey show in September? Pandemic robbed the New York, New Jersey fans of watching it live. I don't see that, no. And I wouldn't do that. You know, it's unfortunate that the people in Newark missed out on it, but to do two of those matches in the span of, of you know, five or six months, that's overkill. I would not do that. I would come up with something else, something special to give them. I don't know what that is, but it doesn't have to be blood and guts. It could be a big championship match. You know, by then, maybe they can get a big New Japan star and they can... Do some kind of big interpromotional match or something, you know? The Forbidden Door, all that all that stuff. You know, there's any number of special things they can do as a make good for the people in Newark. Juan Ocampo, no drinking tonight, AEW rating tomorrow. Juan. A Juan point three. You know, you and your puns. Here I am thinking that he is drinking and he doesn't know what he's writing. 1.3, that is his prediction. Well, that that's that's the number I think that they need to be hoping for, is 1.3. It should be at least a little bit higher than the number they hit a few weeks ago. Food Hive, you've got nine days. Miro will be champion. No, Miro will be champion in seven days. So you're actually wrong about that. And finally, Dr. NXT Scorpio. Uh, good stream and review tonight. Have a good night, Solo Monster. And chat. So it looks like Dr. NXT Scorpio is going to get the final word. Uh, Genius in the chat says, I was there with you. What are you, are you talking about Universal Studios? What are you, what are you referring to? 
Maybe I was there for it. I just don't, I don't remember. I've definitely been to Universal Studios, but I don't, I don't remember the Halloween stuff though. In any event, you guys uh, were awesome with all the super chats and I thank you very much. That uh, is very, very cool. A lot of uh, it divided opinion, but for the most part, I think people were pretty happy. At least people in the chat here were, were overall very happy, but you know, again, very uh, underwhelming there on that finish. I think we can all agree. The uh, poll has not uh, changed too much. Now we're just under 80% thumbs up, 20% thumbs down for tonight's Dynamite show. At Solomonster is my handle on Twitter, at Solomonster. So you can go vote in the poll there and follow me. Not that I have anything overly exciting to say on any given day, but... <laughs> If there's news that breaks and I have comments about it, any show announcements, channel announcements, you can find them there. So again, at Solomonster is the place to go. Let's see what's going on in the chat here. The genius says, yes, duh. I don't know what that means. NS Andrew says, I was entertained. Throughout, despite the finish. All right. We do a little something, as you all know. At the end of these weekly Dynamite streams. Shout out to my boy, at Zinfamous HD. On Twitter. Put this little fun Twitter generator together. Long time ago. And we have some fun with it. Just like it says here. Stop the gift twice. That is the main event of WrestleMania. And I have picked some doozies, let me tell you. But it's all random. I have no idea what it's going to land on. We'll pick two people and we'll pretend that's the WrestleMania main event. So let's see who number one is. The number one choice is... Sin Cara. Well, we've already lost. I've already botched. But uh, Sin Cara, one half of your WrestleMania main event, and who shall he be facing? Who shall Sin Cara be facing? X-Pac. So there you go. First Dynamite stream here in the month of May. I have drawn X-Pac versus Sin Cara as the WrestleMania main event. I have drawn the short straw as they say. Bliss fan wants to know, is it Hunico or Mystico? You know, I don't know. That's a good question. I think that's Hunico. I think the one that they showed there in that picture was Hunico. So I guess he would be uh, Sin Cara Black. Remember when they had the original Sin Cara and then they had the evil one? He was the one who took over from the original, right? Man, you know, that, that wouldn't be a bad match, but WrestleMania main event, I mean, come on. Let's, let's, uh, let's be real here. <laughs> Juan, Juan, wait, hold on a second. Juan says, you're getting mugged in an alley in Brooklyn. You need backup. Buy, sell, or rent on Brock, Haku, and The Undertaker. Oh, I'm selling on Undertaker. I am going to rent on Brock because, uh, you know, he don't come cheap. And I'm buying on Haku. If I'm in a foxhole somewhere and I need somebody with me, Haku is the guy, even at his age now. Haku is the guy who I would want as a friend in my corner. Yeah, I always say, when you think back to when, uh, when DX, they... Uh, rode in on the tank they were going to invade was it the norfolk scope where wcw was and then eric bischoff i think it was ordered the gate to be lowered so they couldn't get into the building and they stopped them from coming in they had meng and i believe scott norton as well were in the building that night at wcw for nitro and i've always thought you know eric bischoff is so dumb because all he had to do to call their bluff 
And Bruce Pritchard was with DX. He was with them filming the vignettes and everything. And Bruce is very well aware of who Haku is and probably Scott Norton too, and how tough those guys are. And Bischoff totally should have called their bluff and said, you know what? Leave the gate open and send word to those guys. We're sending Meng and Norton to go meet them at the gate. You watch how quickly Triple H and Billy Gunn and all of them would have tucked tail and gone the other way. They're very lucky that they didn't send Meng to the gate that night to confront them. That would have been great television. That also probably would have been the end of DX. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm buying on Meng. Or Haku, whatever you want to call him. All right, I think we're all... Uh, I think we're all caught up here. This has been fun. Wow, we've gone over two hours. Holy shit. We had ourselves a nice little uh, super chat party tonight here after the, uh, after the stream. I'll be back with you next Wednesday. It's another stacked episode of Dynamite. We got a couple of championship matches. Darby Allen going to lose the TNT title. We've got SCU challenging for the tag team championships, right? We've got a world title eliminator. And we've got an IWGP. Actually, we got three title matches next week. IWGP title on the line, Yuji Nagata. Going to be challenging John Moxley. So another uh, pretty, pretty damn good card on tap for next Wednesday. I'm looking forward to it. Episode 703 of the Sound Off this weekend is going to be a packed show. Uh, Dark Side of the Ring is tomorrow night. I'll have a review for that, if not on 703 on Sunday. Uh, if I can't fit it in there for some reason, we'll get it up on the YouTube channel talking about Brian Pillman. So there's a lot of really good content coming to the channel, including for channel members. So again, hit that join button below this video. It'll tell you all you need to know about the different tiers. And if you would consider joining, I would be so grateful. Uh, but if not, that's cool. Hit the like button on this video. We got uh, one last super chat here from the True Heel Master. Don't be surprised if the Young Bucks disrespect Moxley and Kingston with a Bronco Buster move in a match. I'm not sure why you would say that, but okay, sure. I'm not aware of that being a popular move of theirs, but I'll take your word for it. But yeah, uh, join me back here next Wednesday for more Dynamite. We'll hang out, we'll have a good time, and uh, definitely check out 703 this Sunday. And I meant what I said earlier about Amazon Music. That offer is only good until May 24th. You can get three months free when you use our link. Get amazonmusic.com slash solomonster. You help out the channel and the show when you do. So until then, be well, stay safe. Everybody in the chat, thanks for joining me. Go get some sleep. I know I need some. And uh, I'm going to see you guys again uh, for more Dynamite coming up next Wednesday. <laughs> I don't even know what day of the week the show airs. Holy fuck. I was going to say Sunday. You can tell I need sleep. More Dynamite next Sunday. Until then, be well, guys. Take care.